Now, Marty Park, Marty Park is a is is an entrepreneurial character. He's a guy that's 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 been in the space and owned and operated and innovated, and 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 developed thirteen different companies himself. He he currently owns and operates uh, two very successful businesses. He has an extremely busy and engaging. Um, uh, speaker um, uh, business. I mean, he's he's out there. He was the mentor of the year um, a few years back, and has received all kinds of acclaim for for understanding entrepreneurs, for doing it himself, and just for being one hell of a business coach, of an entrepreneur and a champion of, of, of entrepreneurism in, in so many ways. Um, bringing Marty in was, was um, partly uh, the, was, you know, it happened because Business Link said, yeah, he's the guy, and, and he's awesome. So I've got this really long full page bio that tells you uh, all about all of his, his successes. Um, but if, if you can tune in for just just another just short of another hour, I guarantee that that Marty Park uh, really building them up too, so I had a little pressure. <laughs> now, Marty Park is really going to wow you, and when we enter into that that uh, networking time, and I hope you really engage and, and drink all the beer that Olds College is providing, uh, you're going to you're going to enjoy that. So. Um, I'm going to be far less formal. Thank you, every one of our sponsors, every one of our mentors, everyone who's worked on the committee. I'll, I'll do a little thank you to them after. But please join me in welcoming Marty Park, and then you can have a seat. Thank you. I don't know who the business link guy was that said, oh, yeah, yeah, he's the guy, but I need to send him something really nice, or she. Um, so good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Marty Park. I'm uh, I'm sort of in the perfect I'm the perfect Albertan because I was born in Edmonton and I live in Calgary. So at any point, if I'm doing business up in Edmonton, I can always fall back on, hey, I was born here. And in Calgary, of course, I say, well, you know, I was born in Edmonton, but I've been here since I was seven. I'm a Calgarian. So here at Oles, I don't really have something other than to say I've been on the highway up and back, and I've driven by the Oles sign a thousand times, maybe two thousand times. Uh, as Mitch says, I have a lot of uh, background as an, uh, as an entrepreneur. I started my first company when I was 21. And I'll touch on sort of how this looks really, really nice as a slide or as a bio. I've had 13 companies that I've owned and operated and, and bought and sold and started. Um, I was, uh, when Futurepreneur was called CYBF just a couple years ago, I was their national mentor of the year. Uh, I've been one of Calgary's 40 under 40. Um, I spent three years uh, traveling with the G20 Young Entrepreneurs Summit, uh, where uh, they had a bunch of young entrepreneurs advise all the G20 leaders on how to foster entrepreneurship globally, which was very, very interesting. Uh, and then I actually, with dealing with a, um, an organization I was with, out of 800 coaches, I was chosen the North American Coach of the Year. So that all looks great. <clears throat> and much like business, it's like, you know, you start a business and next week you'll be Google. It's just that easy. In fact, that's how I got started in software. I literally dropped out of university and said to my father, who was so pleased to hear I was dropping out of my fourth year of the commerce program. Uh, he was, I said, you know, listen, by the time all these other people graduate, I'll be retired. And he said, really? I said, yeah, like Microsoft, how tough can it be? <clears throat> and I find that if not necessarily this space, because it's not necessarily just a tech community, but if I was actually, if we were talking about a technology group, uh, all of you had software companies, there'd be at least half the group that would be nodding going, yeah, we're going to be the next Google too. Did you know that statistically you have a chance of being hit by lightning seven times <clears throat> before you start the next Google? And I say that because this is oftentimes the perception people have of entrepreneurship when you're not an entrepreneur. You know, it's your freedom of time, you've got all this money, you've just, I mean, you get to make all your own choices. It's so great. <clears throat> and I say that because going back to this, um, my CV looks nice, but some of the things it doesn't talk about is the downside. So I'll tell you a couple of stories. Um, 
My, um, the first one I love is that there's a couple banks here who I actually believe do support entrepreneurship between BDC and ATB, most, both of them making a bit of an effort and really fostering uh, that. Now, I'm, I'm pretty sure that if I walked in with nothing but the shoes on my feet and said to either the bank, please lend me money, maybe it would still be a little tough, but I do love the fact that they're taking initiatives. Um, one of my experiences and one of the reasons that I think I'm, I'm good at from an advising perspective is having gone through lots of bad experiences. Uh, so I talk about the first business I had where Greg and I thought, we'll be retired in a year. And <clears throat> after the first year, I hadn't paid myself anything, had racked up all my credit cards, uh, was really on my last leg. And it really got serious when we had to go to uh, Greg's dad and, and get a second mortgage on the house to keep our software business going. And so you have that experience and you go from playing business to really starting to do business. And the same thing, uh, in 2008, I had uh, four restaurants going. We were looking to build a fifth. Uh, we were just as fast as we could build it and develop. We had developers every week phoning us to say, how'd you like to build another one here? And, uh, and then, I don't know if anybody remembers 2008. There was this, yeah, okay, so there's a couple people that do. So in two, uh, January of 2009, our sales were off 48% uh, in the restaurant businesses. And so uh, then our bank at the time, HSBC, uh, who was really actually, other than ATB and BDC, who were the in my first 15 years in the restaurant bar business were the only banks that ever supported us. All of a sudden, 2007, times are good, HSBC got into that business. And uh, they phoned me one day, whenever the bank phones you to say, hey, why don't you come in? We just want to have a little chat with you. Don't go to that meeting. <laughs> don't, just fake sickness, whatever you need to do. So we went to the bank meeting and, and uh, they said, listen, we'd like our money back. I said, well, what do you mean you'd like your money back? I mean, you know where the money went. It went into that building that's sitting down in Mackenzie Town. Well, we know, but we don't really want to be in your business anymore. And so in 2009, they, they comfortably or maybe friendly with a smile said, we'd like our money back and you know, just want to remind you that we do have that mortgage on your house and your business partners and also this, and we also have that. Now, we wouldn't want to have to use any of those things. So I tell that story because I think everybody who's an entrepreneur has similar experiences. And that while on the outside, the perception is that Google has never had a bad day I'm sure there are growing pains and an evolution to their business too. And there's a realism to that. I like the idea that um, this is the way it feels to be an entrepreneur most of the time. I'm alone and wandering through a dark forest. <clears throat> I, I like the idea though that this today in the day and age we're in is now a choice. So when I talk to business owners who effectively have sort of cordoned themselves off back in their office somewhere and it's dark and I can think of a guy actually has a, an office in his basement of his shop and it, it's like we call it the cave and he sort of feels like this a lot but I say that because it is a bit of a lonely journey but there are as this sort of event demonstrates there's an entire live community that you can plug into but I also like the fact that now with online there are online groups places to talk to get information um, I have a coach advisor for my business, and he is in Brisbane, Australia, uh, because now with technology, we Skype all the time, and yes, it's morning for him and afternoon for me, but I have access to entrepreneurs all over the place. I'll give you a good example. Um, if anybody's ever been to Whitefish, Montana, um, my family's got a place there, and it's about 6,500 people, so it's not exactly a thriving metropolis that way. Uh, but there's a, a young guy who's taken over his family business, and the family business sort of crept along and ever since he's taken it over, it has just grown and grown and grown. And so I started talking to him. And I said, his name's Trek. I said, Trek, <clears throat> you know, I've watched this progression and I can see all the changes and things going on. What, what are you doing? Like, specifically, you're the only, he's a clothing store, an outdoor store. And I said, you're really the only player on the downtown. Because if you've ever been to Whitefish, it's bars and then his store. That's, that's effectively downtown. And... Uh, he said, oh, I belong to sort of a group of my peers. So where are they? And he said, oh, no, I, I've got 15 or 16 other business owners. They have businesses just like mine. And the rule is they can't be in your state. He said, but we share everything. We share financials. We share pricing. We share promotions that work. We share, he goes, I have learned more from this group. I was like, how did you find this group? He said, online. I was doing searches. I came across it. I clicked on something. I applied. But I thought it really brought home this point of the lonely entrepreneur is something that now is a choice and that you have the ability to say, I can find other people that are in my industry that are uh, doing what I'm doing or innovating in a way that I want to follow. And so my first comment is that you need to start to recognize that being in business is, 
is about reaching out and, and finding that community that supports you, whether it be local or, or around the world. The next thing I wanted to talk about, and I, I want to move from a little bit of mindset stuff to more tactical uh, things that might be applied to your business in today's Alberta economy. Uh, the second thing is I think most people feel a little bit like this in that, and I've had this conversation so many times and felt it myself, where I think everybody else is doing such a good job except me. You know, I drive down Main Street and everything seems to be thriving. I go in to wing night at Boston Pizza and it's packed, and so clearly they're doing a good job. And I go by somebody, I go by the hotel, and there seem to be a bunch of cars in the parking lot, and everybody's doing such a fantastic job. And why do I suck so much at business? And I say that because I have to tell you, I, no matter how well I've done in business, I've always had that element of even having four restaurants. There was guys that had six, and I really envied them. God, they, you know, I bet they're making way more money than us and doing all that. And I had a real awakening with this idea of always presuming somebody was doing it better when in Calgary, there was a group that I had looked up to and they had five operations. Uh, they lost one and uh, had to sell it at a loss, a loss of about $2.1 million. They then said of the existing operations that were still going to operate, they shut another one down, they had three. They were gonna spend the next 10 years in their three operations using all of their profits to pay back the loss they'd had on that one business. And I swear, about 10 days before, I was driving past one of their stores thinking, why can't I be those guys? I say that because every single person I know in business is under the impression somebody is better at marketing, better at sales, better at operations, that they're just lucky they're in a market that, you know, it's got to be easier there. I wish I was in Fort Mac. I'm sure construction's easier there today. Well, it might be easier in terms of there's more work, but is it more competitive? Absolutely. So I like this idea that every, if anybody in the room ever has that feeling like I'm not as good at business and other people are, that we all feel that way. And the real challenge in that is to be able to look and say, okay, how do I get incrementally better every day or, and, and in your business, but also personally as an owner? How do you become a better owner so that the reflection is that you have a better business? This is the way I used to talk about the number one skill of a, of a business owner and entrepreneur. And I still believe this for the most part. I like the idea that the thing when I talk to people about how they've run a great business is they say, I've been 28 years at this. I've been 17 years at this. I've been, and I realized like, wow, just staying in the market and sticking with it seems to be such a proven thing. But <clears throat> what I've discovered is that there's another word that actually goes along with that. And it's this word adaptive. Because <clears throat> effectively, if you're just persistent, but you keep doing the same thing year after year, month after month, then you're effectively somebody in a round room looking for a corner, right? You go around and around in circles, but it's not effective. It reminds me of that old play, Death of a Salesman. Willie Lomax, if you've ever seen the character, um, is such a down and out, body language, kind of slouchy, drag his feet kind of guy. It wouldn't matter if he made a thousand business calls. People don't want to buy something from a guy that down and out, right? <clears throat> I like this idea of adaptive because Whenever we've had success in business, in my businesses, or with clients, we've gone and looked and said, hey, how are we going to change this up? How are we going to make this more interesting? What are we going to be able to do? And so I like that idea that now, and some of my theme over the next little bit here, is going to be about how do you adapt your business? Because it's really little changes from one business to the next. If I think of the printing business, if I go in Calgary, there's probably... I don't know, 55 or 60 different major printers, and then there's a bunch of smaller ones beyond that. Every one of them can print my business cards. So I have to look and say, okay, well, in that case, what is it that differentiates? And oftentimes, it's some element of how they do their business on an adapted basis. Uh, has everybody heard that stat that four out of five businesses fail in the first five years? Everybody heard this stat? I, I'm not actually sure if this is a true stat or if this is like urban myth. <clears throat> Either way, it's a depressing stat, and this is my belief as to why. So the first green line here that sort of shoots to the moon, I think is a little bit about the blissful ignorance I've had as an entrepreneur, uh, but that a lot of people have, is that you get this idea like, yes, okay, the first six months is gonna be hard, maybe the first year is gonna be a little tough, but after that, things are gonna start to take off. And we sort of talk about year one being tough, year two being a little tough, and my belief is that people get to the start of year three and sort of go, God, nobody told me it was going to be like this. And it's because we sort of have this perception that almost like in the music business, you know, you're discovered on YouTube and the next day you've got a world tour. 
Well, it, that's true if you're Justin Bieber. But it's not true for the other 98% of bands who were overnight successes after 20 years of traveling and touring. And I feel that it's the same way, that if business owners knew that the path is actually more like the blue one, that it's actually a seven-year cycle for most businesses to hit their stride, that more entrepreneurs would maybe be a little easier on themselves after two years when business wasn't going well. But more and more, I found people that, yeah, if you have this impression that two years in, this startup is going to be rocking and I'm going to be a millionaire, or in my case, I was going to be an overachiever, be making millions in six months, that you realize that's not necessarily a realistic pattern. Occasionally it happens, and it could happen to you, so I don't want to rule it out. But I love the idea that if you looked at your business in a seven-year cycle or recognized that it's going to be seven years, by year five, things are starting to cook. By year six, you're really like, oh my God. And by year seven, you want to say, don't touch anything. I don't know what we're doing right, because you probably don't. But you just know that things are rolling. And so that's the way I like to look at it. And I, I really stress that if you're, th you're putting a lot of pressure on yourself in this current market or just in your business about maybe you're not doing it fast enough or good enough, evaluate, am I measuring this on a one-year success, a two-year, a three-year, or is it a seven? I have a great friend, Louis, who just uh, is the Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Year for, his, uh, for Alberta, or maybe Western Canada. And one of the things uh, he just said, he goes, yeah, we're in 29th year of business. He goes, yeah, and in fact, this is true. He goes, we've reinvented our business four times with about a seven-year cycle. He goes, so I'm right on track. It's taken him 29 years to get to that place, and that perception now is he's sort of like a phenomenal, unbelievable business owner. But he said, I've been on the brink of bankruptcy at least twice. And he said, yeah, now I'm at this pinnacle of things and everybody wants to talk to me. So I've said, well, ride it out as long as you can. Because <laughs> we don't know when the next down cycle will be. Um, I have to tell a little story about a, uh, <clears throat> a, a, a guy I had sat down with years ago. And uh, he had a manufacturing company. And I said to, his name's Steve. And I said, Steve, tell me a little bit about why you got into this business, how you got into this business, you know, when did it start? And he said, oh, uh, I got into the business 13 years ago. I was like, wow, okay, well, uh, you know, what got you into it? What was your objective? What was your goal when you started? He said, oh, well, my, uh, pretty simple. Um, my former boss was in the same business, and my goal was to run him out of business. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay, I hadn't heard that one before. And I said, so how's that going? He said, oh, yeah, I ran him out of business in 18 months. I sort of reluctantly said, congratulations, because that felt a little awkward. Uh, and I said, okay, well, so, wow, 18 months, 13 years ago. So the last 11 and a half years, what have you been doing with the business? Like, what's your goal been since then? What are you driving for now? What does that look like? And I have to tell you that the longest pause of my professional life, he sat there in his chair, he had a goatee, and he rubbed it for a while and scratched it. He actually got up out of his chair and walked around it. Still scratching his goatee. Finally sat down again and went, I guess to pay the mortgage? I was like, this is what you've been doing for 11 and a half years. You're coming to work every day to pay the mortgage. He goes, well, I don't know. Um, you're the first person to ask me in 11 and a half years what I'm doing. And so there was a couple things that came out of that for me. One was <clears throat> that nobody had asked him in over a decade, hey, what are you doing about this? Or what's your plan? Or why are you doing this? Um, but the other thing is that you can imagine the motivation for all the people that worked with him when the boss's objective was to just pay his mortgage, right? He couldn't figure out why he had high staff turnover, why clients didn't always come back, why the business was sort of mediocre to begin with. And so I asked the question of what is exactly you're working towards? And is there a business completion model that you have? And I say that because we always talk about this life cycle of a business, but sometimes there's that element of like, when it gets to here, this is what I'm trying to build. And sometimes it doesn't need to go further. But I like that idea that, are you working to complete your business? And so with more and more people, I talk about, what's our business comp completion plan? When we know we've gotten there, we can go, this is pretty complete. This is everything I wanted to do with it. I found in a couple of different industries that once I got a business to a certain point, I lost interest. Because as far as I was concerned, I built everything I wanted to build. So I bring this up because I love this image, but I like the idea that if you don't have a plan around the business, then work towards a business that runs without you. Every business owner I know that is able to generate their salary plus dividends, work part-time, take as much vacation as they want, and really have some freedom, whether it's just to pick up the kids from school, to be able to take Friday mornings off to golf in the summer, 
they have such a, they have a love of their business still, but they have worked themselves out of the job. And so more often than not, I say, work to develop a business that runs without you. Now I recognize for lots of businesses, that means you're gonna have to drive a little bit of revenue to put the people in place so that you can still take your salary. You can't just replace you and say, hey, I, I've actually, I, funny enough, dealt with a contractor who said, I put a general manager in. I've just, I found him a week ago, we put him in, we're hiring him up, it's going great. I said, that's great, what are you paying him? The same thing I paid me, only $10,000 less. I was like, all right, so you are now making $10,000 a year. Oh, yeah, I hadn't thought of that, right. He's like, well, what do we do now? I was like, well, now you've just become the head salesperson because <clears throat> we've got to go get some more business. Anyway, I love this idea of being inspired by a bit of a goal. And I want to talk about how you get to that goal in a practical sense nowadays. So this, I don't know that this is necessarily a business plan, but I like this big old book. And <clears throat> there are still organizations, consulting firms and accounting firms that will say, hey, for $50,000, we will build you an 80-page 80 80 business plan and we'll do market studies and we'll do all that. <clears throat> and what I found over the last 15 to 20 years is the number of people that have these incredible business plans that do something like, oh yeah, just hang on, I think I've got it here somewhere. And they go back to a shelf in their office or down the hall into a filing cabinet. They pull it out, blow the smoke, dust off it, and go, well, we've got this plan. I was like, do you use that quite a bit? <laughs> well, of course they don't. Sometimes I've read these plans and said, have you ever read this thing? This has got great ideas in it. Well, we are all already working 40 hours a week, 50 hours a week, maybe 60 hours a week. <clears throat> So when on earth do you have time during that busy week to sit back with a giant book like this and think, God, I gotta flip through this and figure out what the next idea is gonna be. It just doesn't work like that. And we're also in an environment where there is an acceleration of environmental, of technology, of globalization. And with that acceleration, my grandfather used to come back from lunch and he would have four of those pink paper slips, four messages while he was gone for lunch. I come back from lunch and I have 150 emails that I've got somebody sorting through that I then have to sort through the inbox, right? They're the volume of stuff that's taking place and the rate of change. We build out plans with people that typically run on 90-day cycles. A bigger plan is broken into 90-day cycles. We find that everybody can keep their eye on the ball for three months. So all of your staff, if you gave them, here's our plan for the next three months, it can roll up into the bigger plan. But even within three months now, Halfway through that period, we're like, yeah, actually this objective doesn't fit anymore. And we are already modifying it within that period. So you can imagine the old school method of, <clears throat> and this isn't a knock at bankers, but that traditional model of build a big thick business plan and submit it. Um, I actually did years ago had a business person who took the plan, literally picked it up, much like this. Oh, good plan. I swear, that banker didn't even read the plan. I, I know it went into a filing cabinet somewhere and they went, business plan, check. So I love the exercise of it if you have the time, but once your business is up and running, this is what a business plan needs to look like. It needs to be one page, it needs to be graphical, it needs to be strategic. It's broken down here where I've got different measurements every 90 days, who they're to, who's gonna be delivering it, and there's some real accountability. We review business plans uh, weekly, sometimes as a, as a CEO, I do it daily, and we roll everything back, and we, re, we take basically what our goals are for the year, and we work them backwards to be able to take small steps. And so I say that because I've had people go, in an ideal world this year, 2017, what kind of sales increase would you like? And they go, 35%. I was like, awesome, that's fantastic. I like that it's a little more aggressive than what your accountant's gonna say. So 35%, I go, yeah, well, we're not going to actually boost things in the month of March 35%. What we're gonna do is break it down in likely 10 steps and get you 3% every month for the next 12 months. But to re-engineer that, then we could be able to take tangible steps. It's no different than, I often say that running a business is very much like going to a personal trainer. You go to a personal trainer and you walk in today, let's say we're all going to Mexico next week. We walk into the personal trainer and we go, look, and maybe this isn't, so I'll say for the guys, I wanna gain 10 pounds of muscle and lose 20 pounds of fat by next week. And the trainer says, one of us is gonna live through these workouts, right? <laughs> But it's not reasonable, and changing things in a business isn't either, but it really becomes the rhythm of business, that on a weekly basis you're checking in. And all of a sudden things in a quarterly bite-sized uh, uh, approach is really quite feasible. And all of a sudden you get some things where people are like, hey, 
It's only two months in, we already got that done. And it creates a pattern of success. And I would just ask, in your business, are you running small enough things that we create a pattern of success for staff? That we got this right, and we got that right, and we did that, and we launched the new website, and we did that. And there's all those little things that demonstrate internally in a business that, hey, we are doing lots of good things here. And I'll come back to that idea in a little bit. I like this idea of there's a, I, I think most people that talk about the evolution of a business, and it starts here, then we have the business for a while, and then we sell it, or we close it down. That's the standard lifestyle of a business, or life cycle of a business. And I would sort of argue <clears throat> that there's so many variables that can take place in a business that that's not really true. I like the idea that here's an, an example of what a business and some of the things that I know people have gone through in terms of the actual evolution. It can be that element of, well, somebody, I, I need to retire. Or that, you know, we've taken our business from a physical thing to now most of our sales are online. That actually we bankrupted the company and set it up as a nonprofit. That um, my partner and I are going through a partnership divorce, which I think is every bit as painful sometimes as a marital divorce. Um, in fact, I just had a client where, ironically, uh, he attached, like so many of us do, this idea of good or bad to this outcome. Well, Dan and I can't make this work. Um, we're, yeah, the partnership's failing, and we're going to go our separate ways. He's going to uh, take all his stuff. He's given me 30 days to be out of the business. I've got to buy him back out. Ironically, that happened, and he was feeling like an absolute failure at the end of January. Conveniently, he had a vacation booked for two weeks in Hawaii. He came back from Hawaii a little more renewed, sort of getting over the emotion of, of having a breakup in the business. And uh, since then, he has generated more sales than they did in the previous 15 months. I said, what happened? He goes, well, as it turns out, I think our partnership was a bit of a weight on the business. And I was like, oh, interesting. He goes, yeah, I feel a little bit like I can make the decision. I can get the sale. When we had a partnership, I had a, a sort of a dysfun dysfunctional relationship. He goes, so now I'm sort of free. I say that because he said, partnership divorce, if you'd asked him two months ago, it was that, oh, it's bad. This evolution of our business is bad. But more and more, I like the idea that I take less about good and bad for any of these outcomes, whether I merged with somebody, I start a new line of products, that these are the evolutions of businesses that stick. This is the perseverance and the persistence that comes about. And so now what I do is I ask the question, instead of looking at the big events that happen in a business, are you simply improving a little bit every day? Or on a weekly basis, are you making some gains in where the business is at? Because that, to me, is, is the significant measure of sustainability, improvement, and, most importantly, enjoyment. If you feel like you're, has anybody seen the movie Groundhog Day with Bill Murray, an old classic? So every day, right? Every day Bill starts out, he gets it, like he realizes, oh my God, every day is gonna be the exactly the same. And it starts to change for him when he starts to become innovative and starts to do things differently and actually starts to have some fun with it and start to recognize, oh, Hey, I'm in this the same way that if every day you go to your office and you stop at Tim Hortons and you get the same double-double, you drive the same way and you get to the office, you park in your stall, you walk over to your office and you do the same big three, you check your phone, you check your email, you, know, you check the temperature of your coffee. And, and everything goes like that. It very quickly becomes Groundhog Day and the enjoyment level drops. So I love the idea that on a big picture basis, I embrace some of those things. And on the small stuff, I'm looking to be able to say, how do I innovate? Innovating, innovation for me in business is everything. Adapting, innovating, and I love the idea that, <clears throat> and I'll show a slide in a minute that talks a little bit about where we start to peak or maybe start to uh, level off as, as a business. I love this idea, I say to people, listen, leave no stone unturned. Constantly looking for opportunities, people that want to partner, people that want a new product line for you, new ways to do business, a piece of software that might help you. You have to be constantly turning those things over because as soon as you start to kind of create a box and go, that's not the way we do business, your business is now on a trend to not be growing but to be actually be dying. And so we take this approach of leave no stone unturned. And to me, it's really, really interesting. I mean, there has to be rules around that. If somebody met you here at this event and said, oh my God, we should totally partner. And you turned around and said, let's do it. That would be the equivalent of us flying to Vegas and getting married, okay? And unless there's somebody in the room named Britney Spears, that's unacceptable. So I say that, but that's oftentimes the forethought that goes into it. And I can tell you that I just had an, a company that I just sold last March, um, and I had a business partner who's a longtime friend of mine from university, 
and I broke all my rules around the criteria for evaluating a good partnership. Because I thought, hey, we went to university together. We've known each other a long time. Therefore, we must do business exactly the same way. Right. So it's one thing to be able to look at ways to innovate or things or ways to do business with people. But now I have rules with partnerships, right? I own 51%, and as long as that's the first rule, then we can keep talking about the partnership. And sometimes people go, well, that's not fair. Let's do 50-50. No, no, I've had that experience, and I can tell you that doesn't work for me. Now, sometimes it works for people. But I, I like this idea of I'm constantly looking for things. And I don't spend a lot of time. I had a guy last year who spent six months flying down to the US to evaluate a merger and a partnership with a company. And two weeks in, I said, what does your gut tell you? Is this going to work? No. That flat, that fast. Yet we spent five and a half more months. Wow, well, because then he was in that mode of being a good Canadian. I don't want to hurt their feelings. I was like, go ahead, hurt them. They're American. They won't care. <laughs> I think a lot of us have heard this expression of time in a business versus time on a business. And <clears throat> any, any, like, just to show of hands, how many people have heard this expression? OK, so quite a few. Good. The idea being that time in your business is so much about you are answering the phone. You're helping customers with orders. You're dealing with the staff. You are in the day-to-day -day of your business. You're in the delivery of product or service. And this is where people tend to spend 100% of their time. And my ask of you is to just shift that 5%. So in any given week, start to carve out two hours where you can move down below the line and start to work on the business. Now, the first question I get is people say, I don't actually know what you mean by work on the business. And so that is really uh, <clears throat> the act of working on the business is mostly, it looks a little like this. You're in your office, your feet are up on the desk, and you are pondering. Because it's a thinking exercise. Or if you're like me, you're sitting at a bar somewhere quiet and having a cold beer. That's also acceptable, but you have to limit it to one, maybe two. Uh, but I, I say to people, like, what are you working on on the business? And oftentimes people go, I, well, I'm carving out this time. I don't know. So let me give you a, a real life example with a company I met with this morning. They uh, have a marketing agency. The marketing agency does three to four million dollars a year. So good, healthy company. They have great profit margin. They have been sitting on a software program that's sort of specific for a certain line of clients they have that they think is a 20 million dollar a year business. They have a client they have been onboarding as their first client. And as soon as they get the first guy on, they have five more that don't want to be the pioneer, but say, as soon as you can show me it works with somebody, we will beta test it or we'll be the next ones in line. Each one of these clients is worth about $300,000. I was like, you have 1.5 million sitting there and at potentially $20 million a year. What is the barrier here? Well, we just can't find any time to do that. I was like, it's, how long have you been at this? Well, six months now, we've been trying to get this first client on. But we're doing it sort of like an hour here, and then four weeks goes by, and then we do an hour there. I was like, so I thought, this must be really complicated. I said, well, how long have you just sat down and just focused on getting them online and getting them using this software? How long would this take? Thinking they were going to say three months. They were like, I don't know, two and a half, two and, two and a half, maybe, maybe three hours? I was like, stop, stop. Are you telling me that you can't find three hours on the business to just move from your day-to-day -day focus around marketing to just onboard a guy who's worth 300 grand in the software business and could lead to 20 million in a year. Well, when you say it like that, it doesn't sound very good. <laughs> it's like, it doesn't sound good, does it, guys? And this is a great example, though, of oftentimes you know what the problems are in your business. So I often say that time on the business is sort of proactive. The question I ask is, six months down the line, what are going to be the problems with the business? Because it's interesting when you suddenly stop thinking about today, and you start thinking about what's going to happen three months down the line or six months down the line. And if I asked every one of you, and we went around the room with a microphone, everybody could say, in three months, this is going to be the problem. If we get into six months into the summer, it's going to be, oh, it might be staffing. Or it might be my marketing. Or it might be, well, we're going to run into our summer sales dip. But you tend to know. And so the on stuff is to be able to say, what can I be doing today that will fix the problem in advance proactively instead of, reactively getting to July and going, oh my god, the summer sales dip, as though we couldn't have predicted that. To me, it's the equivalent of when people say, sorry I'm late, it was because of traffic, as though we couldn't predict anybody else was going to be on the road. As though it was your first day driving, like how would you have known somebody else was going to be? Sure. I say that as somebody who's constantly fighting to be on time. 
So this is where I, I think most businesses go wrong. So this is the starting point. We start here, ground zero. And we are doing everything as a startup or as a new business. To, we scrounge, we find sales, we do deals. We're constantly working on things. And then finally one day, we reach the X. We can finally start to breathe because the momentum of our client base is now enough to cover things. So I, I take a really basic, simple idea like a, a pizza place. You're now, once you hit the X, on a Friday, Saturday night, you now sell enough pizzas that rent actually gets paid on the first and is not being taken out of your line of credit. For the first time, you go, whew, I think I might be okay here. And then just shortly after that point, we kind of stop. We stop having time because now we've got to make all these pizzas Friday, Saturday night. Now we're busy all day prepping for Friday and Saturday night or any other. We've got staff to manage, and I got customers, and I got this stack of bills I never had before. And business just got really complicated because it's going well. But one of the things I found is that things tend to taper off because what immediately stops is actually the initiative and that fire to do anything to get sales again. You just lose that because you get busy in the business. The other thing that stops is innovation. That again, you were trying anything. Do we do two for one pizzas, three for one pizzas? Do we half a pizza at half the price? Do we do? And you find ways to change the product or change the way you sell it. And all of that starts to go away. And it's not that we, we sort of get comfortable, but it's very understanding because up until that X, it's nothing but turbulence. So I love the idea that when you get to that X, it's a good time to take a vacation and then come back. I say to most of my clients, as an entrepreneur, you should be taking quarterly vacations because for you to come back and then be like, all right, let's go again. I'm gung-ho, I'm back at this. You need easily three times the amount of vacation as other people because other people are not managing the number of things that you're managing in any given day. So people ask a little bit about, and I'll just touch on this, this idea of what's the number one problem. And I think uh, I want to touch on this theme because in Alberta, that's the, the feedback I get from a number of people is that things are slower now than they were two years ago. And so people ask, well, where would you start? And I am about, my answer is simple. They're like, sales. They're, well, what else? Sales. What, about, what else should I work on? Sales. Because I got to tell you, when sales are good, and cash is good, everything else is fixable. You have more money to pay people. You may not want to, but you can still be like, well, at least I can. here's $2,500 as a bonus. Whew, solve that problem, right? I, this marketing looks like it really helps. How much is that? Okay, go, right? You are in, you're in building mode. And what I find is that people, <clears throat> the number one thing that goes away when we get into the busyness of business is sales. It becomes that, you know, and it, you, if anybody's ever managed a salesperson, did you do your cold calls today? You know, I'm gonna, but tomorrow, is, tomorrow's the day. Tomorrow's like cold call frenzy. The next day you're like, you gonna do it? Friday. Friday morning, I'm all over the cold. And things just roll from Friday to next week. And that's what I find happens. And my experience is that when sales are low, yeah, cash flow is low. <clears throat> but cash flow then starts to put some element on, not only is cash flow tight, but it also becomes time consuming. Because you used to just pay the bills on the 15th. But now it's like, Okay, I don't actually have enough cash to pay all the bills, so now I gotta start to break them down and juggle them and manage payments. Then you get into this idea of low profit, which for most of us is part of at least dividends, might be part of your paycheck. And now you're kind of grumpy because you're like, you know, I'm working way too hard for this much money. And then it goes into, you have less decision options. You'd like to do that, but you can't because it requires this much in cash. You'd like to do that, but then you can't because it requires that much in cash. If anybody's ever worked in a business where cash becomes a little tight, it's not the best environment. People just, you never have to say anything as a business owner because people are watching your every single move every day. That's the beauty of being an entrepreneur. You are sort of under the microscope. But what I found is people can just tell. I come into a company, I go, what's going on? It's not good. The best, smartest person in any business, receptionist. So Judy, what's going on? Oh, well, I can tell you that, uh, yeah, things aren't good. The boss is stressed to the max. They're really short with everybody. Things aren't good. Morale's down. I'm like, wow, all that. And it stems sort of like this. Um, when people have the impression things are tight in a business, one of the things that happens is, yeah, you can, ten you can sense how tense the owner is. And therefore, then people start to think, I think my job's in jeopardy. It may not be, but this is the story, because, of course, we always go to the worst. I am, I've talked to so many people who are like, I'm losing my job. How do you know? Did somebody say something? No, I can just tell. I can sense it in the air in here. I'm like, not usually. Funny enough, it's usually high performers. It's usually people that are doing quite well. The person who actually should be worried about their job, never worried about it, always oblivious. <laughs> the other thing that comes out of this is when sales get low, you have low future. 
You can't be thinking about how this guy's sitting on a beach with a laptop and working remotely and vacation every quarter, because you've got no cash to do any of that. So I go back to the number one thing with owners, that if you are not out doing all sorts of sales, and I'll talk a little bit more about what I mean, because I don't just mean this element of cold calling or you know, forcing people like a used car salesman to, to close deals. I don't mean like that. But I go back to some element of the business owner's time, because they're the best salesperson all the time. And some, if, if you can, also have somebody else who focuses on sales. It is the number one thing. Um, housing companies in Alberta for the longest time have been terribly run. But when you're making that many sales every single week and people are lined up around the corner to buy condos, you don't really have to have a tight business model. So I like their philosophy of when business is good, we're geniuses, and when business is bad, it's the market. So I want to talk about sales, and this is how I get into it with business owners. And the first thing I like to be able to do is educate your clients. Now, to go educate your clients, the best way to do that is face-to-face. -face. I'm actually doing a training program with a bunch of lawyers where we are talking about how to get out and meet our clients. This is literally like, take them for lunch. Phone up your client and say, I'd like to take you for lunch. It's crazy seeing a lawyer who's very successful in his law world in his mid-50s who goes, I, I, I can't take them for lunch. What are we going to talk about? Well, I don't know. You could talk about the flames or the oilers or the weather or... How's business for you in 2017? We actually had to create a cheat sheet of questions and topics for lawyers to talk about when they take clients for lunch. I say that because business, if it's not flowing in the door, means you have to get out to the business. And there's two things. I say educate clients because what I found is statistically 18% of your clients can name all of your services and products. So uh, a great example, Jordan Singer, uh, who's the third generation of Henry Singer uh, clothing and menswear, uh, one day I said to Jordan, we were at a dinner, and I was like, oh yeah, you know, my sister's getting married. We all, my dad, we went and got custom tuxedos, six custom tuxes, da-da. And Jordan said, why didn't you buy those for me? I was like, since when do you guys do custom tuxedos? Well, we've always done custom tuxedos. I was like, Jordan, how would I know that? He said, well, if you go into our store, there's a little sign, a little eight and a half by 11. I was like, how big's your store? 6,000 square feet. It'd be like trying to find that little sign in this room, right? That's what he was using to educate clients. I said, you think I wouldn't have spent and got my family to spend some crazy number like $13,000 on tuxedos? It, with you? Of course I would have. 18% of your clients can name all of your services and products. Think of it like going into a restaurant. How many things on the menu without you peeking can you actually name off the top? Not very many, and it's like that. So the first thing I found is just getting out, talking to clients and educating them and talking about what they're doing is the best way to go. I ask them two things. One, what do you need? And the second thing is I ask them to buy. Because fundamentally, just like they say with salespeople, the number one fall down is they don't actually ask people to buy. I've sat with so many business owners where we have a great meeting and they go, okay, well, this has been great, thanks. And they leave and we get to the car and I go, what about hey, next steps, or the order, or, well, I didn't want to pressure them. They weren't feeling pressured. Get out of your own way. It's one of my favorite sales rules is get out of your own way. <clears throat> this is a great one in Alberta, is, and, uh, and with clients, has been plan future purchases. Uh, my, my best success with this is uh, somebody who is selling <clears throat> compressors to ConocoPhillips in Calgary. A compressor is worth about a million dollars. They were selling them one at a time. Hey, we just sold the compressor, a million dollars! And they had a bell, bing, woo! <clears throat> and I said, just kind of randomly, how many compressors will ConocoPhillips buy in a year? Oh God, 15 or 20. So we just sold them one. What's our plan now? Well, we're gonna go back next month and try and sell them another one. You can see sort of the failed logic in this already. And so, what I found with clients is to be able to say, hey, what have you got coming up? So we went back to ConocoPhillips and said, how many do you think, how many have you got budgeted? They already have a budget with this laid out. We got 16 laid out, budgeted this year. Well, okay, are you gonna buy all 16 from us? No, we like to split it up between two or three companies. If we gave you a better price and knocked 10% off, would you order them all through us? Oh yeah, then I'd be under budget, absolutely. Would you sign a contract saying you're ordering 16 for the year from us? Sure, if you make sure that the price is there, I can spend the budget whenever. 
So all of a sudden, we came back to the office with a new contract for just about $16 million and went, woohoo! <clears throat> so interestingly enough, I said, so great, when are we going to start to talk to them about next year? I have found this to be true in my marketing agency that people do the last campaign and then you're like, what do you got coming up next quarter? Oh, God, yeah, I guess we should think about that, shouldn't we? You have to be driving the needs of your business or based on the needs of your customers. So you have to get in and talk to them and say, listen, what does the rest of the spring look like? Because they are like you. They're business owners with their heads down and they don't have a chance to even look up and look into the future. But when you can start to talk about planning future purchases and sales on the long term into the future, it gives you so much more stability and insight into what's coming up and then you can plan your business more effectively. And sometimes there are huge wins, much like my compressor story where that wasn't planned, but it, it took just a couple questions and a couple phone calls and meetings face to face with some of these big companies. And we went, there's a gold mine here that nobody all of our competitors were working the same way, one sale at a time. That's the way most of the people in your industry work too. And if you can suddenly outsmart them by thinking about it differently, great. I love this word raving fans and I love the word indispensable. Can you imagine if you got to a place of indispensable for your clients? Where people literally, and I've had a couple of clients where I used to have a friend, I have a friend named Ryan, he's now a friend of mine, but a past client. And I could literally phone Ryan and say, hey, I need two more clients. And he would say, I'll go to work on it for you. He was such a raving fan that he would then phone somebody and be like, listen, do you need this? Do you need to talk to Marty? And he would set up a meeting. And then he would show up at the meeting and say, listen, this is really a no-brainer. You need Marty, tell him what you do. All right, great. You guys need to work together. And I'd be like, wow, I don't know what kind of voodoo trick I've put on this guy, <clears throat> but it's working great. If I could bottle this and sell it, that could be my new business. I say that because uh, there's a level of in indispensableness that I think uh, in, a, in a market like this where you have to do a little more or try a little harder uh, is something you really need to focus on. And most importantly, have your staff focused on. You know, I was at the uh, Red Deer Lodge a few years ago and the girl said, how was your stay with us? And I said, well, actually it was awful. I said, the radiator in my room rumbles like there was a rig running in my room, uh, the bathtub I started to shower, but then the water got to mid-leg. I was feeling kind of creeped out, so I got out of that. And I went through this whole list of problems with the room. And she went, oh. And I was like, right. Nobody's actually informed you on how to create a raving fan or even how to deal with problems for that matter. You were just, the lesson was make sure you ask people how their stay is. So I like the idea with raving fan that we train our staff and we have a bit of a method. I like the more outrageous it can be and the more personal it can be, the better. If you sell a product for $100, make it $110, and then in the mail, send them a Tim Hortons card for 10 bucks and say thank you in a handwritten card. Right? I always love the idea. Uh, we were dealing with a commercial real estate agent. His commission was typically around $10,000. I said, listen, why don't we spend out of that, we're going to put $400 aside and do something nice. We're going to send them off to BAMP for the weekend and get a night at the BAMP Springs. Are you kidding me? That's not $400. I'm like, they're paying you 10000 so, I, but I love that idea of a percentage and you create raving fans. If you don't have any budget right now to create raving fans, at least do it with heart, with handwritten notes, just a phone call. I had a printer friend of mine, Jerry. Jerry was doing a terrible job. I actually said to my staff, we're firing Jerry as a printer. I know he's a friend, but they're doing a terrible job. Jerry phoned me literally the next day, just by fluke, although maybe it wasn't. Uh, Jerry phoned and said, Marty, listen, I know we've dropped the ball again on a printing job. And I just want you to know I'm aware of it. I'm striving to make it better, and I'm sorry. But I really value your business. You're important to me as a friend, as a customer, so I just hope you'll give us another shot. Okay, Jerry, right? I, and sincerely, though, I was like, thank you. Thank you for phoning. Perfect. I became a raving fan of Jerry and sent him more business over the next couple years because he was aware of it. And this goes back to me. My uh, grandfather worked at Don Wheaton Chevels up in Edmonton for 27 years. And I remember as a kid that he was the guy, old school, because the phone used to be attached to the wall. It would ring, and he would pick the phone up, and it had a long cord, and he would go, okay, uh-huh, yeah, okay, all right, I'll be right there. And he would hang up the phone. And I didn't understand as a kid what was going on, but what I understood was that whenever any customer he had had a problem, and they couldn't get hold of somebody at the dealership, he always gave them his home number. And so they would phone and say everything from, I'm here on the white mud and my batteries died, and he would drive out in his car and fix it to push them out of the snow, to get a shovel, to organize a tow truck, to do whatever. 
And uh, he went on, and I got to talk to past customers of his, where sometimes there was four generations of people that bought cars. And they said, he's indispensable. He knows more about cars. He knows more about service, his attitude and spirit towards it. And so I take that idea of all those things, not only knowledge, attitude, and spirit, but all that that made him indispensable. And I like that idea of where you at in terms of indispensable, uh, making your fans or your customers raving fans. I also like the idea that if you've got clients, ask them. We grow most of our businesses through referrals and just asking clients, who else do you know? And people are always afraid to do that. But if clients like you, they're more than happy to help you grow the business. I want to talk a little bit about Alberta-specific things because, again, I think we're in a unique market here. Ironically, the market in Alberta used to be, for a couple of years, I got to do talks like this where we talked about, how do you retain people? Because it's so hard to find a guy who doesn't want to push a broom for $48 an hour. We have less of that problem now. Um, I have clients who traditionally have just done their business in Calgary, who are now doing business in Lethbridge, Red Deer, Edmonton, province-wide. They have had to cast a further net to be able to maintain or grow their business. So whether it be sort of the Olds municipality or wherever you're typically dealing, you might have to go further. <clears throat> I say look online. Uh, there's a great story from uh, Vegerville, home of the big egg. Uh, Vegerville, where there's a little company. Again, they started producing organic cane sugar. You can imagine in Vegerville what the market is for organic cane sugar. It's about 10 people. right? So they recognized, they, they set up a storefront, but they quickly recognized that some of these organic products, there wasn't enough in that marketplace. And they went... As sort of Brian alluded to, they set up a website, they started to do some search engine optimization and some work digitally, and before you know it, the online side of their business was as much as their store, just with better margins. And they have now transitioned to the online as the primary. I met these people and I was like, you're in Vegerville, right? And we went back with that whole, yeah, home of the egg. I was like, right. But I was shocked at how savvy they were in recognizing the size of their business and how they had to broaden it beyond where they where they started in order to be able to just continue to grow it. And so online, no matter what your product is, I can buy anything online, right? I can go to Tire Rack and buy tires. I can buy a home, I can buy a car. I can go on eBay and buy a jet engine if I want. I wanna say promote, um, and I don't mean advertise your business, I just mean promote. That more often than not, if you are in your office, you're not promoting your business. So I've seen people where they are like, Hey, you know what? We are just going to get out with clients where we get out and we deliver pizza. And we're having a pizza party at a client's office. One of the best things we did was uh, an event uh, with a big builder in Calgary where we did a launch and we sent donuts, customized donuts from a place called Modern Jelly Donut in Calgary. Uh, we sent donuts to, uh, I think it was 38 suppliers. I have to tell you, they got more referral sales from all of their suppliers being so excited about donuts, because don't overlook the power of a donut. It is, it is amazing. We have used these where custom-made donuts, because they've got your, you can put your logo on them, and people start to be like, years later, in our marketing agency, we would grow somebody's business up to have a great campaign, and we'd go, but what did you think about all that? They'd be like, oh, that was great. But you know that time you came with the donuts? That was unbelievable. And you're like, wow, just can't beat the donut. I say that because they promoted their business through donuts, through all of their suppliers. 38 suppliers. We added up how many employees their suppliers had, and it was about, uh, I think it was about 2,800 employees. They reached 2,800 people directly and generated so many new sales to their condo project and new home, new home uh, subdivision they were launching. It almost made all of the other advertising afterwards irrelevant. Um, the other thing I've said to clients in Alberta is you may have to add lines. I'll give you an example in our restaurant business. Uh, the restaurant business has been down. We've been down about anywhere from 18 to 8%, depending on the month and the time of year over the last little bit. Uh, and so uh, the way we've gotten that back is by adding lines. We've had to look and go, okay, where can we get on with all of the teams, community associations, churches, and become their preferred supplier for pizza, pasta, or anything that might be Italian? Where have we been able to say, okay, these are, we can do catering and being out promoting that? Because we recognize the number of people coming into our business is reduced. So we take the onus to be like, great, we've got to get out and do more things. We've asked people, what else could we offer? We've gotten the extreme. Do you guys do sushi? No, there's no such thing as Italian sushi. Carpaccio, that's about as close as it gets. 
<clears throat> but I like this because other clients who have said, hey, we've had things fall off. Have, uh, we've got a client that does chemicals, uh, industrial chemicals. They've added lines over the last two years to maintain sales. Now as their market comes back, right now at this point in the year, they're up 32%. And now we're catching the wave as the economy potentially comes back a little bit. But the only reason we wrote it out was because we added lines of service or added lines of product. Um, I want to touch on team a little bit. And, and I had to throw in the Connor McDavid picture because, in fairness, he, if I had to hire a superstar, he'd be the equivalent. I say this because the way the method has gone in Alberta has been sort of this. <laughs> if anybody's familiar, this is the Chiefs uh, from 1977, the movie Slapshot. <clears throat> These are the Hanson brothers. They are not good hockey players. <clears throat> and so I'd say this comparison because in Alberta, I've seen this all over the place. We don't feel empowered as small business owners to say, I'm going to hold out for the A players. We were like, ah, we need a guy and you've got two arms. I guess, yeah, you qualify. <laughs> no, no joke. I have actually talked to people in northern Alberta who have said, if somebody has four limbs, we're hiring them. I was like, what? And they said, it's so hard to get people. And so my attitude towards that is, you can only afford to hire A players. You're not a business school where you got to teach everybody. You're not a life academy teaching them life skills. People need to show up, batteries included. You need to be able to show up ready to work, capable of doing the job, because if you can't find people like that, then pay the other people that work with you. I would much rather pay 20% more to five staff and be able to say, you guys are outstanding, I'm gonna ask you to do more, work some overtime and pay you more, than have that money go to somebody else where I pay 100% to the new guy, where everybody else knows he's terrible. He, in fact, drags everybody down morally. He drags everybody down from a, um, a production perspective. So I'm a big fan of people come into my business and our rule is now, are you batteries included? What did you think? And we just have that phrase, batteries included? No, no, I didn't think so either. Boom, they're done. <laughs> well, it, it really is. It's, uh, it's, a, uh, it's one of those, as I talk about innovation and rules, I have rules around people now. And it's not that I understand there's programs where it's like, well, we can get an intern and we can train them. Yeah, in a small business, you don't have time for that. In a big company, they can do that. They can move from department to department and flounder and learn and take up time and space. In a small business, you're already working 50 hours a week. You do not have time to then say, hour 51, I feel like becoming a mentor and a teacher to some of my staff. <laughs> Ideally, you should do that anyway, but not in that context of new people. So I'm a big fan of, if I had, as much, I'm still a Calgary Flames fan, but if I had to hire a player today, he'd be Connor McDavid. Ironically, I play hockey with some guys that look like the Chiefs. <clears throat> um, I want to talk a little bit about what Brian was saying just before. And my big thing is, people have said, what should we do about our marketing? And I've generally said, stop doing it. I ran a marketing agency, and I owned a marketing agency for four years after running it for a year, and then we privatized it. It was publicly traded. I say stop because, and I'll tell this as a story. I worked with a home builder named Terry. He did $86,000 a year in glossy magazine advertising, because that's what lots of home builders do. Uh, we went out, stopped all of that advertising, went out and bought 2,000 bucks worth of signage. Simple signs. Show home this way. Arrow. And we plastered all of the streets and areas, because we recognize the people that come to see a show home, oftentimes on the weekend, are last minute. Right? Unless you're going to a show home parade where there's a new community, to catch one-offs like he was. So with the $2,000 we actually of signage, we drove traffic. We, he got way more foot traffic and way more people coming into his show homes. But we saved him 84,000 bucks, or 86,000. The net was $84,000 savings because we stopped useless advertising. I say that because if there was one place I would look right now if you're going to spend money, it is absolutely digitally. The, the cost per click, the cost to get leads, if you get a good capable person like Brian overseeing it, then, yeah, it is outstanding and absolutely the way I would go. You can build, as he indicated, you can build funnels that target people in this age, in this, I mean, down to, uh, in the U.S., they can tell you what street that person lives on. In the U.S., there's freedom where I could almost be able to say, this is the, you're a cat person. How do you know? Just by the profile we've developed. It's a little scary, but it's really useful from a business perspective. Um, I want to tell a story about uh, this phrase, storytelling. I want to know the story of your business. I don't want to know the marketing. I don't want to necessarily see a sale. I want to be compelled. So 
Everybody know an insurance guy? Is there any insurance guys here? No? OK, good. Then I can tell the story. <clears throat> I was going to have to go a whole different way if there was somebody in insurance sitting here. Uh, so there's a guy named Van Mueller, and Van is out of Michigan. And uh, I met Van at a conference a few years ago, and I said, uh, hey, Van, what do you do? Expecting him to say, oh, I'm in insurance. Because this is the way we talk about our businesses. What do you do? Oh, yeah, I've got a manufacturing company. Ooh. What do you do? Oh, yeah, I, I own a restaurant downtown. Wow, it sounds like it must be a great place because you're clearly excited about it. But Van is my favorite example. I said, Van, what do you do? Oh, Marty, I, I work on the greatest product ever developed by mankind. It is unbelievable. It saves lives. It, it's, oh, I can't say enough about it. I was like, well, what is it? I was thinking like greatest product ever invented. I thought heated car seat. I thought, <laughs> right? I mean, you know, that list of obvious things that, uh, and he said, no, Marty, I sell insurance. And I literally, I was like, sorry, sorry Van, I thought you said you sell insurance. He's like, it, yeah. I was like, have I missed something? He goes, Marty, are you aware that insurance is the most powerful product? And it is the, it's the only way that you can take all of the wealth and everything you've created in your lifetime, pass it along to your family, create legacy without the tax man touching it, the government touching it. It's completely protected. It is generational wealth for you and your family forever. And all of a sudden I went, God, maybe I need some insurance. <laughs> and I have never met another insurance guy who told a story like that. But Van is top of table, which in the industry means you're one of the highest producers. Van goes in to meet somebody. What's your name? Ben. ben. So Van goes in to meet Ben. He won't just meet Ben. He wants to have at least 10 people in Ben's family. He will not meet with you unless there's 10 of you in the room. And he will sell every single person a life insurance policy. Not because everybody needs life insurance, but in part because he adamantly believes in it. And I say that because if I go back to where to start marketing and that, it's really combined with this idea. If you get out and meet people and you get back the enthusiasm of telling a great story, make it interesting. I, it doesn't, I mean, it can just be, play it off your friends. Does this sound interesting? Find somebody who will be honest. Don't use your spouse because they're going to say it's not interesting anyway. <laughs> they hear your story all the time. But I love this idea that storytelling through effective channels is really, really great. Uh, my, our marketing agency picked up the story of results rule. And everything we did was around this story of results rule, results rule. Everything on our social media. And then all we had to find was somebody who was looking for marketing results. Bing. And then our story was really interesting. But I found that was way better than, well, you know, we're in marketing and we're creative and blah, blah, blah. And I feel like if there's one thing you could take away from a marketing perspective is find your story. Um, just touching on Brian, I like this idea of play to your strengths. I loved a lot of the things he said from a social media and from a digital marketing perspective. Let's be honest. Most of us do not have the time to look into that. I did discover that, was it Hotjar? Was that the product? Right? That apparently I've been that creepy person. I was just on a law firm site last week, scrolling through the partners, scrolling back, scrolling back, <laughs> clicking. And I'm like, wow, now somebody could be tracking that. That's really, wow, now I am that creepy guy. I say this because most of the time I say to clients, what are you outsourcing? What are you responsible for? And they go, well, I, a little bit of everything. No, you're responsible for two things, selling and maybe you're some role in delivery of product. For me, it's coaching, training, advising, and selling. I'm either delivering services, standing up here like this, or I'm selling. Those are my only two functions. I didn't build this PowerPoint, right? I don't build our website. I don't handle our social media. I don't even handle my own schedule. I've got somebody who's now starting to take over email. The reason for that <clears throat> is because I'm recognizing that the value of my time and what I can sell in an hour is way more than the cost of those things. Great example, I dealt with a guy named Shashi who had a printing company years ago, and uh, he didn't want to hire a salesperson. And, because you know, there's no money, no cost. But we finally got him to hire a salesperson. In the first month, the guy sold $35,000 worth of printing. He paid for six months of himself in the first month. And within the first year, he generated an extra, I think it was $120,000 worth of profit for the business. But there was always that element of like, well, but he needed to just outsource some of that. So maybe it's not sales, but if it's not you doing sales, then you've got to outsource that to somebody and build out a team of people. There's all sorts of virtual ways you can do this. I know people that are now doing everything from their bookkeeping online to social media being uh, handled out of the Philippines to, again, there's global access to things even 
in Olds or in Alberta. Um, one of the last couple of things I wanted to talk about was this idea of celebrate your progress. I just had a client in Red Deer, and she said, as a kickoff meeting with all her staff in January, she said, well, let's go through some of the things we got accomplished last year. And she said, you know, I've started the list. I got four or five. And she phoned me, and we were on the phone, and she said, I'm overwhelmed. They came up with 28 things that we got done or implemented or put in process last year. Can you believe it? 28 things. I said, how did that make everybody feel? She goes, well, we were over the moon. We were so proud of ourselves. I was like, that's great. I said, imagine if you kept track of that list for three years or five years. Imagine the track record of success that that would demonstrate. She was like, oh my God, can you imagine almost 30 things a year? We'd be close to 100 things in three years. I was like, right. I love that idea that innovation has to be an ongoing effort. And so I didn't mention this before, but I like innovation at one thing a month. One thing every single month you innovate within your company. It could be anything, right? It could be the uh, one month for us uh, was improving the quality of coffee in the office. I got to tell you, improve the quality of coffee, bring in Friday donuts. Staff are jacked up on caffeine and sugar. Morale skyrocket, right? That was my innovation for a month. But I love this idea of as soon as you start to celebrate and recognize those things, um, it really creates a pattern of success in a business, and people get jazzed about it. One of the best experiences I had was working in a software business. I'd sold the one I, went, I, worked, I owned, went to work for somebody else. And a guy, Ben, who's now a, a longtime friend of mine, uh, Ben said, well, we got our first deal of over $100,000 in software sales. And Ben said, listen, let's get a champagne bottle. And then we put a new label on it that said the company that we sold it to, the value of the sale, and the date. Now, the first bottle went up on a shelf, and it was pretty lonely. But then we were like, God, we got to get another bottle. This is embarrassing. And it spurred us on to get another one. But by the end of the year, we had a dozen bottles. And suddenly we were like, wow. And it boosted everything. It became a point of pride. And I bring this up because creating pride, creating enthusiasm towards sales, creating a record of all the things you're changing and doing is one of those things that you can then share in your marketing. Hey, these are all the things we're changing in our business. In the story, when you do sit down with clients and other people face to face, it's great for internally. It has so many pluses. But I find when the market is a little bit down or a little bit flat, your job as a business owner is to find ways to lift people up. And this element of celebrating our progress and just being a little bit of a celebration person is critical. It doesn't always need to be a lot. Um, I, I'm always just shocked at how people are overwhelmed by a $10 Starbucks card. You were doing an incredible job. Here's $10. Oh, my God. I, I, I've sometimes said, don't, don't panic. It's just $10. It's not that big. But there's some element of recognizing those celebrations and, and rewarding people. I want to just touch on this idea of evolution of a business. I like the idea of, and, and anybody who's been in business for a while here knows, that business really is... It's a little bit like accounting. When you first get into accounting, you understand everything to be black and white. And then as you get further into accounting, you realize it's all a lot of shades of gray. What account do you want that to be in? Well, we could move that from here and put it over there. Well, we could reclassify that. I say that because no matter where your business is at today, <clears throat> you have the option, much like a chess game, where all the pieces can move anywhere. If you took chess and removed some of the rules, and now I could move a pawn anywhere, business is like that. If you're running a Boston pizza and you want to change it to a subway, yeah, you might have some problems franchise-wise, but you could do that tomorrow. If you're in ag furniture or ag equipment and you suddenly go, you know what, I want to be just doing business online, you could make that transition. If you wanted to look and say, as it turns out, I hate most of my customers, I want to fire them all. Well, we could start doing that tomorrow, right? Now, there's, a, now there's an effect or a result or a repercussion of some of those decisions. But I say that because oftentimes we paint ourselves into the sort of box of this is what my business is. But if you ever look at some of the long-standing businesses like Sony, they didn't start as the Sony that we knew in the last few decades, right? They started 100 years ago making uh, lawnmower parts, I believe was the, the emphasis or the, the foundation of that. And then lawnmower parts became something that eventually became transistor radios, which eventually became, and there was again that evolution. But no matter what it is about your business, you could change it up. This hotel could start to just say, you know, our new focus, we love weddings. We're just going to do weddings, and that's going to be our focus. Forget all the rooms. Unless you're with a wedding, you can't have a room. And they could build a business on that. So I say that because every single part within your business is at your discretion to change. Now, maybe not tomorrow. But every one of the staff you have, it's up to you. You can decide whether they stay or go. Right? If you like your bank or don't like your bank, it's up to you. 
Everything is at your discretion. So I wanted to push this idea that as an entrepreneur, we all have choice. And I will say that I give congratulations to everybody in the room who runs a business. Because people outside of being an entrepreneur have no idea the pressures and stresses that come with it. And there's something to be said for creating a business where you're sort of a uh, home-based or you're a solopreneur. It's a whole other level of complexity as soon as you get a physical space and you've got rent every first of the month and you've got staff who get paid on the 15th and 30th. There's, I always love when people are like, oh yeah, but again they go back to that speech of you got all that free time and all that freedom and I'm like, right. Just every once in a while I'd like to have a giant backpack of weights and be like, here, this is what entrepreneurship feels like, put this on. And just say to people, walk around for a day and they'd be like this by the end of the day. I'd be like, How's, how do you like an entrepreneurship now? <clears throat> so I say that because my big thing with this is you really have to embrace that, that there's a challenge you've taken on. But as I say to people in the restaurant business, listen, it's busy Friday night. Look, we're not curing cancer here. Okay, we're serving meals. Unless you're in the cancer curing business, which could be somebody in this room. Sometimes we get really serious about business. And it is serious in that oftentimes there's attachments, personally, guarantees, financially, those things. But I've really started to enjoy business way more as I've gotten back to this idea of, hey, this is teaching me things and skills that I'm not going to learn anywhere else. I actually now look for people in all of our companies who have run a business. If you have some entrepreneurial experience, absolutely, I'll hire you. Because you have a scope of understanding all aspects of the business that the average person just never gets to see. I want to end on this last story. Um, this is my friend Jim. Uh, Jim owns Sylvan Learning Centers. Uh, anybody familiar with Sylvan Learning Centers? Okay, okay, most of the people. So for anybody that doesn't know, they're a franchise for helping kids with uh, a tutoring service. If you're having trouble reading or writing or math, um, they help with that. <clears throat> and so Jim actually lives up in Edmonton. And uh, uh, Jim has owned as many as, uh, well, I'll tell you how he started. Jim started out as a school teacher. And so he uh, had a daughter, and she was having some struggles. Uh, and so somebody said, hey, you should try out this place called Sylvan Learning Centers. So they took their daughter, had fantastic results, a great experience. And Jim was really like, this is great. As a growing family and being a teacher, he started working Canadian Tire in the summers to make, have a little extra cash, make ends meet. And uh, <clears throat> he started then, and, and, and nights and weekends, he also, through the school year, worked. So he was a hardworking guy. And <clears throat> one day his brother-in-law says, hey, you know that Sylvan? There's, there's a Sylvan franchise in, in Edmonton that's available. Maybe we should buy it. So Jim had been able to put a little bit of money aside and had just enough with his brother-in-law to put some money together, and they bought the first Sylvan franchise of theirs. And so now Jim went and was a teacher by day and a, and a tutor right after, nights and weekends. And again, continued to work hard. But it didn't take long before they bought a second franchise. And then he bought his brother-in-law out, and then he bought a third. And about five years ago, he had 22 locations in Canada, the U.S., Alberta, B.C., Las Vegas. And, uh, <clears throat> and so I said... That, to Jim, like, we were, him and I were having a beer one day, and I said, you know, you, I mean, wow, you've done so well. Like, I mean, look at, you know, where you're at financially, and you've got 22 locations, and, and he said, yeah, but it's always, it's just a function of the number of people I serve. And I said, well, what do you mean? He said, Marty, listen, when I was a school teacher, I had a class, I think there was 28 students, and he said, I helped 28 kids a year, and I got paid, correlated to the 28 kids. And he said, now, this last year, we helped almost 2,800 kids at our, at our centers. And he said, now I'm compensated because I'm able to help 2,800 kids. And he said, so I never lose sight of the fact that it's always about how many people you help. He said, money is the result. And I loved that lesson from a guy who could have been quite arrogant about all of his success. But I take that away because in all of your businesses, even if things are tight financially or you're struggling in this market, the question to really start with every day is, how can I help more people? Ideally, starting with your clients and people out. But if you don't have anybody clients that you can help today, then find somebody else to ask that question of. Because inevitably, money is a result of those types of initiatives. And the innovations that sometimes come for me in business have sometimes been crazy one-offs that I went and did something that wasn't even our business just to help somebody out, and they put me in touch with somebody else, and before I knew it, there was a huge opportunity in front of me. And I like the idea that all of that, uh, it pays itself forward. So I wanted to just explain and share that story with Jim because I think it's quite uh, a profound lesson. Other than that, I just wanted to say thank you for having me. Uh, 
I hope that there's been a couple of examples or items that I've given you that would help you just move the business forward for the, the spring season and the balance of 2017. Uh, I, I hope that you get back to the office tomorrow morning. Maybe take just a little bit of time to go through all the notes that you've probably scribbled down for the day. And if nothing else, find three things. If you took a post-it note from this and figured out what the top three things are that you need to do, um, that's about all you can do. Right? To be able to say, I'll tackle 40 things this week isn't realistic, but three might be. And otherwise, I hope that there's lots of innovation in your business, lots of adaptability, and mostly lots of fun for the balance of 2017. So thanks again. So Marty, on, on behalf of all of us, just a small gift. It's uh, a little bit of me from one of our local meteries. Oh, fantastic. And, uh, uh, thank you very much for your, your wisdom. Thanks, Appreciate it. Ladies and gentlemen, it is definitely beer o'clock. And uh, we have uh, some tremendous sponsorship from, from Olds College for our networking time. But before you leave, I need each and every one of you to pull out your smart device. If you could uh, pull that out in, in your hand. And... Uh, just going to make everybody feel really awkward and weird until, until I see a whole bunch come up. Okay. Again, this event uh, came at a really modest ticket price because we had tremendous sponsorship. This event was powered by ATB Financial. Uh, Business Link is another key sponsor on this event, and so is Economic Development and Trade the government of Alberta. Ourselves at the Olds Institute, we were also able to come in as a key partner. Uh, Mountain View County, town of Olds supporting ourselves. Um, the Pomeroy Inn and Suites, again, big contribution. Uh, Olds College, uh, the Chamber of Commerce, Uptown Olds. All of these people were on our steering committee and they've been meeting weekly for about the last 15, 16 weeks. So if I could have you um, take that device that you still have in your hand, and we'd like to encourage these groups to come together again and maybe do something like this again next year. And so if you could type in hashtag um, power up AB, and if there's anything you learned today, or if you want to thank ATB or the Ministry of Economic Development and Trade or Business Link, or one of the other partners. Um, we, we really appreciate your feedback. There will be a survey that goes out to each of your emails, so all you have to do is have either uh, registered or when you showed up today, given us a business card, and, and uh, ONET will have full coverage of the event on demand on your, your local TV platform, and we will have Vimeo, uh, we, we have taken footage for Vimeo. Presentations will be available, again, really thank each and every one of you for participating our amazing sponsors and in your bag or when you registered this morning or when you showed up this morning there was a, a ticket that will get you a pint of beer and so again thank you very much Olds College for sponsoring networking thank you to Pomeroy Inn and Suites for actually giving us this venue complimentary to ensure we were supporting entrepreneurs pretty amazing